Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, Nashville session drummer, producer, and engineer, Tony Mora. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, everyone out there in podcast land? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of The Rich Redman Show is coming your way. And as you can see, I've got a great friend with me. This is long overdue to have this conversation. I spend a lot of time with this guy. We go way back. But he's a very accomplished drummer, producer, engineer, of course, my friend, originally from Queens, New York, and now calling Franklin, Tennessee, his home, my friend, Tony Mora. What's up, pal? How you doing, man? <sighs> Good to see you. Yeah, it's yeah. like... <laughs> now, I just got to get my uh, my my box set up here. I had this this cool road system, and it's got all these cool samples of like hand claps and oh, toilets cool. flushing and crickets and all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a regular radio DJ. Uh, you know, so you know, at one time I was at the Burbank Airport, and some I ordered coffee, and this girl didn't look like she was old enough to know who he was, but she goes, "Are you related to Casey Kasem?" Oh my God! You know what though? <laughs> it's good. All right, yeah, that, I can, your voice. You could have a little of that in your voice, man. Yeah, man, I'll take it. You know what I mean? Yeah, right, that guy, man. Every gosh, that was our Sunday thing. Yeah, he had his top forty, and that's what you did. We went to church. Stirred the sauce and then watch, and listen to Casey Kasem. <laughs> oh my God, the sauce sounds so good, man! I had a tuna fish sandwich for for lunch, and but the sauce sounds really, really good. But hey, man, so I'm looking at this this bio here, and right. you know, there's all sorts of folks that listen to this podcast, mostly drummers. That's the low hanging fruit because you and I lo know so many drummers. But I'm just right. looking at some folks that you've worked with live and in the studio, and I want to hear stories about these people, man. Thank Taylor you. Swift, Katy Perry, Selena Gomez, Carrie Underwood, Diane Warren, who I just saw on the Academy Awards the other night, Kip Winger, Bruce Springsteen, Amy Grant, Donna Summer, Roberta Fleck. Come on, man. This is, you're a highly accomplished cat, Marin. You know, I want to hear some of these stories, man. And of course, we can go like, okay, take us back to Queens. Because you have been playing since th three years old. I thought I was cool. Six. But you're <laughs> well, from I a musical family. Right. Well, but my grandfather was a drummer. Well, yeah. let me go back a little bit. Yeah, take us back. Okay. Take you back. You need a little Italian music open. <laughs> little accordion. The My year whole, was 1900. Yeah, probably. So the whole Mora family, there were 13 kids in the Mora family from Foggia, uh, Italy, which is in Pani. It's, it's like at the top of the heel of the boot. Ah. Where my, the, the, they're from. And basically, my great-grandfather, his they were farmers, but his gig was he was the town musician. So when they had the weddings and they had the, the funerals and parades, he was the guy that taught everybody in the town how to play music. So therefore, all my great uncles and great aunt played, except one. One became a pharmacist, which was like, what? Where did that <laughs> come from? And then the, the 12 of them, my Aunt Julia played uh, violin, and then I could go through all the names, but I, I probably won't remember them. But my grandfather, Faustino, was the percussionist. Yes. But they all had to play um, a melody instrument. You know, they all had to play piano or whatever. So Accordion. Accordion, right, exactly. So my grandfather was the percussionist. So they grew up in Pawnee, and then when it, when things were getting... Um, I guess it was around World War One. After World War One, they were they weren't old enough to be in World War One, but it was you know like okay, it, we got to get out of here. Yeah. So they sent my uncle, who was the um, pharmacist, was the second oldest. So he came over first, went to school, went to university, became a pharmacist. So then um, the Mora clan, all twelve of them, then became part of a touring classical opera company that toured Italy and Europe and then America and so what would happen is is when they came to America three would stay to whoever could they whatever they could afford to come they stayed nice. and the next trip the next group stayed so that's how the Moors got here so and it's very typical like there's all those jokes on Facebook about you know Italians and stuff we all lived on the same block or near each other and saw each other all the time and I did have three of those uncles who lived right next door to us in our house. So it was my grandparents downstairs. We lived upstairs. And then my three uncles next door. One played one played all the kind of wind instruments. One was a piano player. And the other one played um, guitars, mandolin, and all that. 
And my grandfather, you know, he didn't couldn't bring a drum, but in the summers when I was little, he used to sit on the little porch we had, and he would tap his little drums. He had nice drumsticks, actually, these old big wooden ones with gold handles. Oh, wow. And, like good little gold br brass. They were like little brass ends on them. I still have them somewhere. And he would tap on the uh, wrought iron f gate, his rhythms, and then the other three would sit on the porch and play. Amazing. In the summers. It was yeah. awesome. It was really cool stuff to grow up with. So, and then my one uncle, my uncle Gene, he was the one that really took it full time. He played in the NBC orchestra. He was, um, he, t he went to Juilliard, toured at Juilliard. And then he was, so needless to say, I was, there was no way I wasn't going to be a musician. Do you know what I'm saying? And it was just in your, in your blood. And, and I think it's, just, it's incredible that like, there is something about that. That, that Italian immigrant story where it's like the grandparents live downstairs. Italians always take care of their elders. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. You know what I mean? That's and not you know always the case. Right. You know what? The funny thing is, is that like at the time, I have a cousin, Peter, who was a piano player. And, um, you know, he was much older than me. And we used to like be like, oh, man, the uncle. Are coming over because my the uncles used to have, they were very formal always wanted me to wear a tie you know and all oh, that wow. stuff like you know for when i used to go to school I had my uncle used to, you know they were very proper very proper men yeah and uh, my grandfather was the sweetest guy he was a poet he was a barber really that's what they did but they were barbers or they owned restaurants that's why i'm a good cook too do you have some of his poetry i do it's in i have a box of it and it's you know, I, I want to get it translated at some point. It's all the poems you wrote my grandmother. Oh my God! It's also it's all like 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 Shakespearean, almost like romantic. It's an, yeah, it's in Italian. It's all wow. like Italian lyrics and stuff like that, wow. and prose and stuff. So, all of that to say is that it was cool. But at the time, when you're a kid, you're like, I just want to go out and play, and I, I don't want to sit in here and miss Little Mario Alonso. I want to go play my new Kiss record. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, it was that. You know, but looking back upon that now having my own kids and we moved from all our family from you know my, I had, we adopted our kids here right but we weren't didn't have that experience where we had the family all the time and it really was great there's really so much of that like that's one of the reasons you know so many people and you you're the king of the promotion thing and yeah, i'm not I, they call me a promo sexual yeah you 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 are man you thanks are the, kevin murphy okay ah. <laughs> but you know no seriously it's like it's people don't get that they would say oh you know um you know if you cut a track for someone they want the video after the fact yeah which they don't get for drums it's not easy because you got to write out what you play i don't remember what you know yeah but still it's not even that it's like it growing up around all those musicians man it was there was no man well i'm great listen to what i could do because they would knock you down in a heartbeat yeah you know like not in a negative way but it was like they they just would say you know there's always someone better behind you you know be humble do your job it's a, you know it was for me it's funny because it was never about being famous it was never about you know at one point when you get 16 and 17 and you're in rock band, you, you want to be in a famous rock band but it, oh i saw the pictures of the hair you had a klemberg haircut buddy I, yeah that's right that was my idol but the thing is is that it was always work and it was there was always such a high respect for the gig yeah you know what i mean so I love that, but it's so hard now because it's like to do a video of myself. It's like, oh my gosh, it's just hard. It's like I have that, you know, I have that like kind of be humble, you know. It, but it's it's just such a different time. Yeah, it's a, it's an accompaniment instrument, and that's fa that's great that like people in your family and close in your your close knit group of people would say, hey, you're playing too fast, you're playing too slow, you're rushing, you're dragging, you're you're stepping on the lyrics. Like a lot of that. I got schooled on that like in my 20s and you probably got that out of the way in your teens. Oh man, I, even earlier, my yeah. father played at a club called the Rex Manor and you know, Maria Bartolomo, you know, the, the, the news, the, the money girl, the, yeah, Maria Bartolomo, her family owned it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. At, at some point her and I had to be there at the same time, you know, because I went every weekend, mostly on Sundays with my dad to this club and it was the cool days, Rich. It was like, You'd go play a show on a Wednesday. They'd have a comedian in, and they'd be the band behind the comedian after dinner. Then, like, on Thursday, they'd have, like, 
or any kind of vocal group would come and the band would back them up. And then on the weekends, they either did weddings or whatever, but they also did these shows. And there was a singer, her name was Margaret Manning. I'll never forget her. She, you know, she was like, and I'm going to mention names. Some of you young drummers won't understand who these artists are. Look, look her up. One of the sexiest women ever in the pla- on the planet was Anne Margaret. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, right. So this woman, Margaret Manning, looked just like her. She had red hair. She used to wear the gowns, and she could sing her butt off. And I mean, like, this is like standards and legit music, right? The American Songbook, yeah. The American Songbook, exactly. So my dad would back her up. And, you know, I was young. I was like five, six years old, and I used to come, and I used to go play Sonny. Or I'd play, like, um, the look. I'd play a little bossa nova, and oh, yeah. little, little Anthony was going to come up and play. So I don't remember. I think one time I came up and I played "I Want to Hold Your Hand" or some some rock song that the other guy was singing. Right in the show, they would add their rock and roll tunes. And I'm sure at seven or eight, whatever I was, I was playing all over the place, you know. And after after the the the, the gig, you know, she everybody was saying goodbye and. And she came over and she goes, you know, let me talk. And I'm half half asleep. I mean, this was like, you know. It's past your night. bedtime. Past my bedtime. <laughs> but she, she goes, you know, I want to tell you I want to tell you about your father. And I was like, okay. And my dad was a, like, meat and potatoes drummer, could sight read anything. You know what I mean? But he was not Flash. And, you know, he loved Gene Krupa. He was old school big band guy. But he was like, he was a time guy. You know, yeah. he was that guy. And so Margaret was like, you know. I played with a lot of great drums. I mean, she played with everybody, Roy Haynes and all that. She, you know, she's played with all the big jazz cats, and she's like, yeah. they're all wonderful. She goes, but when I have a gig, I call your father. She goes, you know why? Because I don't have to think twice about the drums, and he never gets in my way. Ooh. That's what you have to learn about playing with a singer. You never get in their way. And I mean, she was sweet and loving about it, and I was, and she was gorgeous, you know, shaking when she said, but boy, I mean, obviously, it stuck in my head. So how old were you? I, I had to be like I'm thinking I was in school I remember because I remember saying something I was probably seven or eight years old oh my god I'd, I'd been going there for when I was really little and so and it's funny there was a little room behind the bandstand that was like where they used to put this because you left the stuff there my, you know, and I used to at when my some nights when I would go my father would put his drum bags and I would sleep on the drum bags until the gig was over. <laughs> How cute. So, so I just grew up with it. I mean, yeah. there was never a time when I said, oh, you know what, I think I want to be a drummer. It was like G.I. Joe's, Tonka Trucks, Slingland Radio Kings in the basement. Amazing. You know, and, and, and it's funny because my mom will say, like people ask, so your dad really got you going and really he did. I mean, there's video, not video, well, you know, the eight millimeter film of him with me banging on the snare drum, but... Oh, God. My mother used to, my father had the, the Radio King set that I have here in the studio. That was his. I still have it. I reconditioned oh it. It's great. Yeah. So that's what, what I had. What was, I was that? Spoiled. Is that Swish symbol that, that I play sometimes with the rivets? Was that his? No, that that's mine. That was mine. But I have his symbols here. Yeah, but don't but don't you I would never have, let you I would never let you play yeah, those. I don't you, even, would, you I don't wouldn't even want me play those. You would want me to breathe on that thing. So <laughs> so but didn't your didn't your dad leave you his um his charts for his big band? Yes, and actually, George Lawrence has them now. Really? Yeah, I gave them to George because he was at one point. I think yeah, it was George. He was good, trying to do a big band thing, and he needed all kind of charts. But please tell me you you have a copy of these things. I have I have some. I have some of them. I left. I saved here. Yeah, yeah. yeah I have, definitely have some of them here. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and I so yeah, I have the drums, and that's what. So there was a, he had a new Slingerland kit. He was a big Slingerland guy. So the Radio King was set up downstairs in the basement. Yeah. But I couldn't reach the pedal, so I used to stand up. And what my mother used to do, see, back in our house, we had a nice, it was a finished basement, but we didn't have hot water heaters. You had a boiler. It was this huge, humongous boiler. And yes. it was and it was in the basement. So and it was creepy, and it would make noises, and you yeah, know, you're, right? You know? You're absolutely right. It was totally yeah. creepy, man. After six, five, not even six o'clock, after just three or four o'clock, it was like, I'm out of here. So... <laughs> But yeah, so my mom, when she used to go downstairs to do the wash, she was a stay-at-home mom for a while, a long time, and she would, you know, sit me behind, she would put her records on, it was like Tom Jones, The Four Seasons, um, Bobby Goldsboro, I remember, like all the people she loved, Engelbert Humperdinck, those guys, and she would put on the records, Beatles, the Beatles of course, and she would put on the records and she would say, play, you know, play daddy's drums, so she would know where I was. And she said, the story goes that, like, at one point, 
I was about four or five, and she said to my father, um, uh, you know, I could always, I could tell that he was just banging her up, but he's really starting to make, like, I can't tell that he's, if it's him or the record, he's playing with the records. You know? Wow. So, so that's how that happened. And then it was just, I guess when I was like four, I was old enough to go up and down the stairs myself. And, uh, and I used to just go and put on records and play. So it was, and you know, it might be two, three songs, and I go upstairs. But it was that, it was that kind of thing, you know. And it was never, oh, don't go play; it's too loud, or do we have a dinner, or whatever. They used to have a bell, that, like they rang a bell for me to hear, or they would flash the lights when it was time to come up. But that's that would that's like my story. It was that, you know what I mean? It was not. Yeah, I want to play. It just was a thing. It was a part of your life, it and was a part of my life. You and, know? and you were just getting good at it by just being immersed. And the fact that so, how long did your dad play? Did he play his whole life? He played up until the point. Um, trying to think, because I was sixteen, so he was probably in his early sixties. And he was he played. You know, he was he was in he was in print shop. He was a photo a print photo guy. Yeah. Um, in advertising that was his day job when because he was full he played full time until a um, little after he got married and they um, uh, were having their first baby my parents had a miscarriage so but he went full time into this job he had done that before but he went full time when it was the kids were coming along but he played all those years I mean and he started young too yeah so I mean so he he played Right up until, like, my parents wound up getting divorced, and that kind of, like, you would think, all right, now he's got more time to go play, but he got real sullen about that, and then he, he wasn't playing as much. So he played into, he died when he was 66. He was young. He got oh, cancer. Wow. Yeah, wow. he got cancer, and, and he smoked like a chimney. You know, he, he, you cigarettes. Know, cigarettes. And also, they think the type of cancer he had came from where he worked, because back in those days when they used to do printing, they used to make plates, and they would have an acid bath. And they think those open acid baths contributed to that type of cancer that he had. But anyhow, the thing, the cool thing about the Radio King set is <clears throat> he had his his newer '60s, the newer '60s Radio King set, and um, we had those set up downstairs. And then um, at that point in time, I had been married. I moved. I didn't have my drums in the house. And I was like, Dad, why don't you go down and play? Like he loved that Natalie Cole record with. Uh, with uh, Nat King Cole, the unforgettable record where they oh, yeah. merged their voices, and that was his favorite. Record. I want you to go down and put it on. I had a great stereo system. I said, just play with that rep. Just, no, I don't want to play. So now at that point in time, now here's how great my my dad was. He took those Radio King set, and I bastardized them. Oh my gosh, what I made him do to them. Changed the lugs to be the newer Slingerland lugs. He painted them. He changed the pl plastic on them. Oh, my no. gosh, it was like what those drums went to. But at that point in time, um, everything, I had every part, every screw, they were in the back basement, but they were totally on, you know, they were, there was no plastic on, it was just the wood shells and all the hardware in a box, because that's what became of them. And he, you know, he wasn't upset about that. But I was like, and you know, part of the thing is, and you know this, Rich, but I used to work at a drum shop in New York. I studied with Joe Casadas. Yes. Um, you know, and, and he had a drum shop, and then I worked there. So I built drums for years and did all that kind of stuff. So what was that drum shop? What was that drum shop? It was called the Modern Drum Shop. Wow! You mentioned Dave Yersikian the other day. He studied with Joe too. Yeah, Dave's next. I'm going to interview him at five uh, o'clock. Yeah, so you he, guys got he, the same teacher. We got the same teacher, and it's funny you could ask him because Joe used to say, "My students should become uh, successful or crazy," which is true. His half is, so Dave and I did good, man. You know, we, we did all right. Well, but, so who yeah. are the crazy ones? Do we know these guys? They just like they just lost uh, their mind, or like I'm sure. Yeah, some of them. But I mean, New York will do that, trying to New get York your drums be, into a, a cab or a yeah. subway. Or I think it was because Joe. It really was Joe would take anybody that had twenty five bucks. It was twenty five bucks an hour for lessons. At, I think he would just take anybody who would give him twenty five bucks and teach him. Well, what was know? his what was his curriculum? Was it was it like get your hands together, get your readings to, reading together, get you uh, yeah, like the Jim Chapin Independence? Yeah, it was old school, man. Yeah. It was all because he studied with Henry Adler. So it was all the other stuff. So it was the Buddy Rich book. It was the, the Chapin book. It was Louis Belson's book, 4-4. Four, four. He did a lot of great stuff with that. Oh, reading in 4-4 four, four time. Yeah, reading in 4-4 four, four time. But it was, it was something even that he did more with. It was because that was like the your syncopation. Because back in New York in the day, you either did Ted Reed's syncopation or you did the Louis Belson book. Yeah. Louis Belson was one of his best friends. So what? he did the Belson book. But he used to do a cool thing like it was... Because it still had your straight quarter note, eight, eighth note stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he would do a thing where you would play, 
Like, okay, I got a pair of practice sticks here. Uh, guys, uh, Tony's Mark. getting his sticks. So, all right, so you would re if something had like, say the rhythm was ba 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 ba, right? And you were reading it ba 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 ba. ba, ba. He would make you play the rhythm, which I'm probably going to forget, but he would make you play the rhythm with your right hand and fill in the triplets with your left hand. Left. Uh. And that, so he used the syncopation book that to get your left hand learning how to come. Yeah, so whatever, the, whatever was written out, you know, if it was like one, two, three, four. You would play that. Right, let's have right, let's right, let's Yeah, yeah. So you, but you would just, you play whatever, the, whatever written rhythm is out, you played that with your right hand on the pad, you know, and then you filled in all the triplet notes with your left hand. Whatever was like a rest, you made, you filled in with triplets. Nice. And then you would take that and you would put it on the drum kit. And so you would play your right hand in bass drum with what whatever and the left hand on the snare drum and everything was swing you never played ever when you were in your lesson with joe with joe no way it was all swing. because straight eights for were for the you know like the dumb rock guys yeah hal blaine guys just ruining it for everyone i actually liked hal blaine yeah you like he liked that stuff but you know and he would he would show you some rock stuff but it was very um very not classical, but very, very, I mean, we did the Sarone book, and we did, oh, you know, yeah. a lot of the reading stuff we did that. And then he had his books, and his name is Joe Casadas. You could find his books. If you're a young guy watching, or if you're a guy that's never done did books, and you want to work on getting yourself around the drum kit, his story was, man, he lived in, um, in this Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and there was nothing going on there. And he had his little four-piece drum kit. He came up with all these different patterns around the drum kit. Then rudiments around the drum kit. And, you know, I was 16 when I went to him. So I was already, actually, I was already doing gigs when I went to him and stuff. Yeah. But I, you know, my reading wasn't great, you know, and all these, I know, concepts. Listen to the song and play it, you know what I mean? And, you know, so that's 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 sort of, when I went there, though, it was like, all of a sudden, all the Vinnie Kaliuta stuff and all the Steve Gadd stuff all made sense because all of his it was all rudimental and in order all of a sudden it made sense why those guys did what they did yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. they all studied that way so that joe's thing was very and then the cool thing was he had all these cool uh jazz charts um and he put on a record and then he taught you how to tommy i goes dad sonny i go was a big treat teacher in jersey at that time right right, right. so him and joe very much taught the same way and sonny had a book called setting up phil so i did all that stuff with joe yeah. We did a lot of that kind of stuff, and now well, that's when I, great. That's deep, you know, man. It's, it's, it, 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 it's it, yeah. It, it was it was um, it was really you know, and he was amazing. He was like, he played with uh, Peter Nero, the piano. That was his main gig. Peter and Peter Nero played. Everything was fast. And he played with, yeah. He and it, he could he could play so quick, Joe. And you know, it was like, it was, he was big on speed. Uh, you know. That's cool, yeah. you know. But that doesn't speed doesn't pay the bills. It's know? it's it's nice to have in your bag of tricks because I because because sometimes you can get really thrown off if you, if you're not playing fast tempos, ding ding ding. It's the first thing that goes for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Ding 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 ding. Yeah, I mean you know, and it, it's it's funny because when I got into and it's cool. It's I kind of feel it's a little bit of a lost thing. Because people don't teach swing. It's all there's a lot of sh everything's you know because that's the music yeah. now. It's all this rock. There's no rock. shuffles on the radio. I mean, there's, there's no more shuffles. Bad, you know, like, bad Leroy Brown ain't on yeah, the radio. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not really a call for that. But you know, it's like it's fun, like you know in the R and B world. Back and you know like a big part of my touring world was in that genre yeah, I yeah, was well, a white guy in the R&B well, okay so how did you get to that because so you go to Joe at 16 you're already playing gigs so you already have a groove you got a feel you've been yelled at a million times right. simplify don't rush don't drag you're too loud and then you go to Joe and you get you, you get some hands and you get some concepts and then um, when when did uh, Brooklyn Conservatory of Music Queens College Aaron Copeland School of Music come in okay so I went to I was going to high school. I was going to St. Francis Prep. I went, you know, it was like a big private Catholic school with big football program. I was going to play football. And I got there and I was like, wow, I'm in a band with two really hot chicks 
football took a back seat, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> so no, I mean, I was in a band. I was playing already. So I, that, I went that route, and I actually this is crazy. As an elective, I took um, music theory because right. I figured it's an this is an easy A. Yeah. Now there was me and this kid, this guy Tony Perallo. He was he was my idol in high school. He was my age. But this guy studied with Sonny. I go from that's how he's how I found Joe. But he studied with Sonny from when he was like six or seven years old, and he had the prettiest hands. He, could, he wasn't a hard player, but he had the prettiest hands. So he and I were like, let look, we we're juniors and seniors. Let's take this stupid music theory class. We'll get an easy grade. Well, we had a teacher. I won't mention her. I think she's, she might be dead, but Sister Maria Alta was her name. Oh, Sister Maria? Did she slap you on the wrist if you didn't do your homework? Uh, no. She was okay. cool. I mean, she was cool. She had, like, she was into Emerson Lake and Palmer. She was into cool music. Wow. But she literally had that old school, like, drummers aren't musicians. You know? And then we, we did a thing. This was so cool. We, we took a thing out of, I forget which book it was. It was, it was like a snare drum book. It wasn't the, it might have been the Nard book. There was, a, do you remember the, do you remember? National the Association of Rudimental the Drummers. Drummers book, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I played all the left hand parts. He played all the right hand parts. And we did, we, we did a whole. You broke up your hands. Yeah, we broke up our hands. And we learned, we, we wrote out what our parts would be. We, it was crazy. Wow. And so we performed that and we got a D on it because it wasn't musical because it was just drums. So, wound up that junior it was no it was our senior year um we both failed we failed out we got we got we we or we got d's i think we got but that does, that's not fair i mean were you doing your sight singing and stuff we did our sight singing we did we would come up with i i had melodies at the, she just it was just a real because uh, it always came down to drummers like you know one she one day it was so funny because She's, I walk in and we had the shittiest drum. Oh, can I say that? I don't know if oh, of know. course, yeah, yeah. Right, so we had the, the crappiest drum set for this <laughs> private school that was a big, you know, ton of money. They had, they had the worst drum set there, and everything was like big sizes and stuff. And you know, we walk into class one day and the drums are set up, and we're thinking, okay, well, wow, why would she have drums? This woman hates drums. And I walk in and she's like, "So you're this great drummer." I'm going to play a song and you have to play it. Let's see how good you are. And I'm like, what? wow. And she said, I don't know if you know the song, but it's a, it's a hard one. It's called Funeral for a Friend by Elton John, which I had played 5,000 times growing up. I mean, I wore that record out. Nigel Olsen was my biggest Oh, God. Guy. Yeah, heck yeah. So now, first of all, it's hard to hear it, you know, because it's a school stereo system, you know, and I'm trying, having to play it. I nail it. I just nailed the song, you know, and it was just one of those mic drop moments, you know, bam, sat down at my desk, you know, picked up a girlfriend after take that. Take that. Guy. You know, take that, yeah. Still not impressed. And it was just, it was so hard. So anyway, long story short, I wind up having to go to the Brooklyn Conservatory to kind of make up that class to bring my grade up, right? Oh, so my God. I so there was a so there was a branch in Flushing that was close to my house in Queens. Yeah, yeah. So I went there for like you do what you did in a whole semester. You're doing like three weeks at this class, you know, because you're there for three, you know. And the professor there was freaking off. He was doing gigs. He was a horn player, and he was like, "Oh my!" God. And so me and Tony went to the class. Tony and a couple other kids. And he was like, and we had one kid was a bass player. I wish I could remember his name. Blonde kid. He was freaking awesome. He could, he was doing like Jocko stuff when we were in high school. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so he we would jam. That would be our class. He would oh let's play. He would bring out the the the, the real book. The real book, yeah. And we would just do stuff. And, and you know, he was like, your teacher was nuts, man. And but I see what a difference. A, a teacher can make because oh, my in college God. I fa I failed algebra the first time because I had a horrible teacher mm. with communication problems and no patience and then the right. next time I had a very open minded friendly let's work out after class and I got an A and you got an A so she he was like you know and I if Tony and I were literally doing gigs at that when we were eighteen we're out playing making money yeah and so he was he's like you guys you know he said look. I could get you in here if you want to come and really learn theory and harmony and stuff like that. So I, I did. So I did. I did a semester a semester there, and literally I loved it and I learned a lot. You know, um, but I was gigging. I was gigging a lot, and you know, then from there, I auditioned and got into uh, the Aaron Copeland School, which was Qu Queens College. Yeah, yeah. Now, at the time, I at the, the 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 there were a couple cats in New York when I was growing up, who were, you know, the cats, because they were from the neighborhood. They were from either 
Brooklyn, Long Island, or the city, or whatever. And there was there was there was two guys. There was three guys actually. Uh, Danny Gottlieb. Yeah. And then there was Rod Morgenstein. Yeah. And the and um yeah, I'm trying to think who the third guy was. Oh my god. Oh my god, Phil. Phil can't remember his name. Anyway, Phil. Uh, he taught at Drummers Collective. I can't remember. Anyway. Oh, um, mm, no, yeah. Um, well, you know, I just saw Danny the other day because he backed up um, Bob Moses at Nelson Drum. Oh, I know, man. And Bob, oh, my gosh. I love Bob. I wish I would. That's what I said. I wish I would have known that was happening. I, know, I knew Bob. Okay, next well, time there's a you know. drum event, we're, we're going. It's like yeah, a, guy, it's a sure. guy's night. Guy's night. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, Danny Gottlieb, I, he was a Miami guy, and Rod was a Miami guy. Yeah. So, I'm like, I'm going where they're going, man. Because, you know, I mean, and this is knowing those guys before they were those guys because they were just the young guys we all idolized at the you know you'd go to the long island drum center and you know rod would be you know is that still there yeah dennis yeah. richie owns it okay i mean there's a couple of them but the original one is still there Good. so yeah so those were my and i wanted to go to miami but that was just when my parents got divorced and we go through a lot of my grandfather passed away so there's uh -huh. a lot of change in our house and i, I and my dad wasn't really kind of with it you know, for that. So I was like, oh, you got to, you know, you stay in town and you go to, you know, and there was the Manhattan School of Music. Uh, but, you know, it, I, so I wound up at the Aaron Copeland School because it was in Queens and all that stuff. All right. I'll tell you this. So I, went to, I was there for a semester. The, um, I really actually, you know, all the, all my other classes that I had to take were great. Now the music class, that's, so I'm taking my, I'm doing my timpani thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> So I, now, always, I always had good technique, but my tuning was always a little rough. Okay. Perfect segue, my brother. See, that's why you and I are compatico, because we oh. work great together. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, I'm in the music room practicing tuning timpanis. Now, this isn't the bullshit where you have the little thing and you dial gauges. it in. There's no, gauges. There's no gauges. It's you got to tune it, you know? Oh, yeah. So, uh, so I'm there with the tune, and I'm, you know, tuning the, the timpani, and I'm working on tuning them, you know, and... I, at that, I had worked at the drum shop on weekends through high school, so I got good at tuning drums. So, but Tiffany was much harder. But I'm I'm working on it. So at one point, I'm tuning, and I kind of dialed the tuning in for Takata from ELP. There was this tune, and um, Carl Palmer does like a Tiffany solo, and I just started. I and I'm. I'm like, oh my god, I think I got it. So I was playing, you know, I was playing it. Yeah, I was like, so a professor walks in, right? And I'm there, you got to picture it. Now, most, most, not all of them, but most of the students there were like from different places in the world. I don't want to sound, it's not a racist, but it was, it was very this and that. Multicultural, yeah. Yeah, multicultural, but there weren't many Italian guys from Queens with hair down to here and a Led Zeppelin denim jacket, five <laughs> You know, there wasn't many rock guys there. So I'm tuning it down, playing this thing, and the professor is Mr. Moore, what are you what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, I'm I said, I'm I said, oh I'm, I, I said I'm tuning, I'm working on my tuning and I came across I said, I'm yes, do you know it's a kind of you know, Yes, I've heard, I've heard, yes, I've heard. And I said, Well <laughs> just listen, man, I said, I got it. This is it's a kind of goes, Well, how do you know what you're playing? I said, Well, I know it in my head. He goes, You can't know it in your head. Where's your music? And why are you tapping your foot? And he went through all those things. And at the end of it, he was like, and it was like a Thursday or something. And he goes, you will never be a professional musician with that attitude. And I was like, dude, I don't know about you, but I got five gigs this weekend, man. So yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, where are you working? Where are you working? And that, and not to, it was just that there was, in that school, there was no contemporary music program. It was all right. classical. And that was the end for me. I was like, dad, listen, man. You know, finish out the semester, but now uh, I'm going to go work. And I took some more classes at the Brooklyn Conservatory, you know, as one-off classes. And so I did that. And then I just, uh, and you know, it's so funny because years later, I ran into the guy who taught me at Brooklyn Conservatory on gigs, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I learned a lot. It was great. I mean, it was really, I learned so much, you know, in that three weeks, my, my theory and harmony really came together with this guy and, you know, learning stuff. So it was cool. That, that, so that's the story with that. That's the education part. That's, that's the education part. And just, you know, just, you know, you're in the greatest city in the world and, you know, just by proxy and you're going to, you know, like our friend Larry Aberman. I mean, he's like another, oh, New, York, another New York cat. It's like you're going to soak up amazing things because you're in one of the most, the, one of the most diverse, rich musical environments on the planet, right? Especially oh, back then. Gosh, yeah. So, so you kind of have a falling out with higher education and you're like, okay, I'm going to go get my real world education. So something tells me that the next step is... 
you're starting to get some, uh, you know, you're playing great regional acts. And then what is the first touring uh, set? Because I, I bought a case from you some years right. ago called Sweets. Sweet you had, it said Tony Morris Sweet Sensation. So then I, I stenciled over your name and I stenciled my name on there, Sweet Sensation. And I think somebody else owns this case now and it's it's being shifted around the universe. It's being passed around. What was Sweet Sensation? That was your first big one, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, after my education, everybody, I recommend this. Schools are better now. Stay in school because I went from there to driving a van for a zipper company. That's what I did. And, a zipper you know, company? Like, yeah. Why well, would K Zippers? The okay. most famous zipper company in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So that's because my dad was not having it. You're not going to, you know, you know, just, you know, just play. play it, you're going to go to work. So anyway, which was cool because I used to be able to use the van to, move my gear around and, ah. and, here's, and, and here's the thing now you know Marco Sicoli right oh my god yeah grab him okay. so Marco so what, what, I, what I would do because we became friends when I used to work there but at that point in time I had the van I used to get my deliveries done by like 1.30 and I used to park on 48th street because I had commercial plates and I would go hang out with Marco till like, we'd drink grappa till like 6 o'clock so <laughs> tell everybody well, that doesn't know what grappa is it's either is Italian or Greek. Kind no, it's the, but it's I think it's the it's kind of like Uzo ish, but it, yeah. or it's like the tequila of of Italy in the sense of that Italy, you're yeah. you're taking the the the. the skins of the grapes right and then right. smashing those up and grind and yeah, it's but it potent. doesn't taste like wine man you know nope. it's a little it's a little on the border of moonshine it's like paint it's like it's italian moonshine thank you that's what yeah. it is and i in my claim to fame is i drank grappa profusely 20 feet from the leaning tower oh that's awesome that's that a, that's was amazing that's a great moment <laughs> that's a great moment so yeah so, so we had all that and that, and that was cool too because I would meet, you know, Marco, at that time he was um, at Sam Ash, and then he moved to Manny's, but he, all the guys, like the drum shop I worked at, now, because this ties into some of my stuff, the drum shop I worked at, all, I mean, Peter Erskine, Stanley Jordan, uh, Steve Jordan, all those guys came into the shop because it was a drum shop. Like, if you needed a screw for a 1959 Gretsch, we had it. Yeah. And so it didn't have all the glitchy stuff. So I met all those guys. I mean, and that That's was it. really part of my schooling, too. Like, I remember Peter Erskine came in, and I was a little freaked out because I was such a big fan of his. And at that time, he was doing um, Steps. Steps Ahead. Steps Ahead. And I said, man, both sides of the coin. And I said, man, I'm just, this, I, I, I feel like I know. He said, oh, and he wrote out the part for me. So that a lot of that happened. Roy Haynes and Lewis Hayes. So many guys. Cindy Blackman. I was so close with Cindy for years. Wow. So, yeah. So, and, and so when that became the hang, and with, with my, that was my, the zipper job made it great to be able to hang with them and not be working. I was now just hanging out at Manny's. So anyway, <laughs> so all of that to say, so that, that's what I did. So they, then you play, and you, 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 everybody did the circuit in Manhattan. You played. It was the greatest time in New York, the late eighties. Um, oh, not the late eighties. All the eighties was great in New York. There was so much going on. Um, I got into the um, drum programming thing very early. Sammy Merendino and Dave Rosenberg. Sammy Merendino was my. If you know that song, Word Up. That's Sammy Merendino. I love me some Sammy. I, I, yeah. Yeah, you know Sammy. Oh, yeah. So he was my idol, and so. I learned how to do all that stuff, so I did a lot of programming, and yeah. I used to bring my SP12 on gigs with me and stuff. So, and then I started incorporating into the wedding band thing. Now, if you're from here, the wedding band is like, oh man, weddings. In New York, that's how you met everybody. Pat yeah. Buchanan, I, you know Pat. Yeah. I played like hundred. I probably did a hundred weddings with Pat. You know, in New York. I mean, yeah. I don't know if it's that but I played with Pat in New York. We did and weddings. now he's playing on country rock records. I was playing on country rock. So that's how it happened in New York. Like, you got Dave Weckl. We used to go, we used to play at Leonard's a Great Neck. And be like, you got to see this guy playing a Bossa Nova. And it was Weckl. You know, playing a So that's sort of, that was sort of how you got to know guys. You'd get on a club date, and the guy would be playing piano, and then he's like, well, yeah, well I'm going on tour with Paul Simon. Or the, you know, doing whatever. So it's still that way. It's still that way. Yeah. Um, here, not so much. It's you know, it, it maybe it's changing. It's maybe getting like that. But in New York, that's what you did. So, what to tie it all in? I was in a wedding band. That was an Italian American wedding band. It was, Ita it was called Solonoi, and we played Italian weddings. Like, 
Italian, where we, the guy spoke Italian over the microphone, like you know, people wow. come up to me and I'm Italian, I don't speak it, but they would be, they might had a whole, I might, you know, I might have actually told the guy I was going to come fix his fence. I don't know what he asked me to do, <laughs> but I had like we had all this music that was, you know, the R and B stuff of the time. We had two girl singers, so Sweet Sensation was really big in New York. I mean, they had, they were in the top, they had like I don't know five six songs in the top ten yeah and one song went number one so we did a, their music in the wedding band and the keyboard player programmed all this stuff simultaneously because i was into the programming thing i started working for this woman suzanne chiani who was the jingle the jingle queen of new york and she was sort of at the end of her career with that and her studio was there and she needed someone to be an intern at the studio so the yeah. jingle singer i knew i got the job as the intern and i wound up the studio manager and engineer so that's how i learned how to do all the engineering that nice and well how, how old were you then oh my gosh that was early i was like so if that was 82 83 i was oh how do you do i was 20 23 22 no, yeah. 21. So 21. she taught you. She taught you the ropes <clears throat> of how to engineer and get these world class drum sounds no, that you're known for. Yeah, you're, that and every and you know, work with some claviers. And she was really had a lot of MIDI stuff was her big thing. Uh, so um, and it was really so it was great. And I that's how I met Sammy because it was a guy Greg Mangiafico. I don't know if you know him. He's he's in town. He's a keyboard player. He had the back room, and so I got immersed in. The session jingle scene. Through is this pre, is this pre Lynn drum machine? Post Lynn. Post Lynn. Post okay. Lynn. And so, do you was, still have a Lynn somewhere? No, I don't. Shit. I never had the Lynn drum. I got it. I I like the emu, the SP12. I got that. That was my machine that I got first. The emulator. The emulator SP12. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, so but Suzanne had a Lynn 9000, and her she had everything. Every, every she had every piece of gear. So I really got into that which really sparked and opened up so many doors to me as a drummer because I could audition and come in and if it was some R&B gig, I'd have like all the claps and stuff programmed and I'd be playing to it. And I'm essentially playing to a click so it felt tight. Yep. You know, not many people were doing that back then, you know what I mean? So, so like would you, would you crank it in the wedge and pass it around or yeah. would you have headphones? No, I'd crank it in the wedge. Because you crank it in the important. wedge, you're just like going... Because we kind of did that a little bit in Dallas. You know, we, we'd be yeah. playing like Coolio and Janet Jackson and stuff. Yeah. And we put like a light shaker as a click in like a wedge. And we right. pro prop the wedge up so it's like right at ear. Yeah. But you still got to crank it loud enough to get it over the <laughs> din of the drums. <laughs> yeah. To, you know? to feel, uh, yeah, it was it was a, it was an interesting kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I, I slowly put together a little rack. I bought a rolling mixer. Yeah. And I would just throw the click into me and then everybody so i got i mean it's crazy how i got into that it's just, it's just nuts because it just was like uh they want me to do how i gotta figure out how to make this work you know because they don't want that in the in the wedges but how am i gonna hear it you know and it's gonna stop for eight bars oh so you'd God. have to split you'd have to split the click to one side only to you and then the everything else to everyone yeah, else and then i would just tell the the and any engineer we we had I would tell them, look, just whatever you're sending into the wedge, could you could I just plug that into my gear? And they loved that because it was less noise on stage. So it was all at the very beginning of all that stuff. So yeah. tie that into, all right, so we're doing the wedding band. The wedding band, I wore headphones. So we're doing the wedding band. I'm in the studio. The guy says to me, be nice if we could record some of the songs maybe we do in your studio and i'm like guadino his name is guadino i said sure absolutely be cool so we recorded all these songs at the, the studio i was in so in the band we had a bass player who was really a great guitar player my friend tommy o'brien he if you look him up he was he's so great an we irishman Irishman, but he's really he's half Italian. His name was Tommaso Salomoni in the band. Italian Irishman. There's something about those two types of people. They love getting together. Yeah, it works, right? So he was a great. But he played bass, but he was the guitar player. So he played guitar on the on the studio on the studio version of our of the band because our leader was a guitar player. So anyway, we had this kick-ass demo of all these songs we did. So long story longer. There's a club in New York called Spodiotis. That I know Dave Santos from Spodiotis. He lived at Spodiotis. Yeah. The bass player Dave Santos. Dave so, Santos. All right. So Spodiotis used to have a jam 
every Wednesday or Thursday night, whatever it was. So Tom, I was working in the studio. We had finished the mix, and Tommy was like, you going to the jam? I was like, no, I can't go. And I said, but, but you know, I'm glad you stopped up. I said, because I have the cassette, yeah, the cassette of the mixes. He's like, oh, cool, man. So I give him the cassette. He's got his guitar. He's going to the jam session. I'm hanging out, doing whatever I got to do in the studio, you know, doing mixes or whatever for some jingle, some bank. So I'm there, and I basically lived at this place because there was a shower, there was a living room with cable TV, a kitchen. It was like my apartment, man. It was oh great. My God. So Tommy comes, you know, buzzes in. It's like 3.30 in the morning. Hey, let me in. Let me in. So I buzz him up. Sweet Sensation was doing a album release party at Spodiotis. Now, Sweet Sensation was a three-girl group, Latin group, but it was English, you know, but they were three Latin girls, and they did that freestyle, mm -hmm. It was that kind of, you know, stuff. And um, and it was very Latin influenced, but real pop and great. It was really done well. It was really produced so well. Yeah. So Tommy goes there and he's like, oh, man, what's this? And she goes, sweet sensation. Oh, my gosh. We, He said, this is cool. We, I do these songs with this for the in my wedding band with these girls. Let me just hang out. So they did their tracks they performed with a couple musicians and tracks and tommy was like standing next to this tall guy and a cigarette hanging out in the middle of his mouth and and he turns around to tommy and he goes uh what do you think of my girls and he goes i have a wedding band that sounds better than this and he was like what and he goes yeah i do we do these songs he didn't know who the dude was <laughs> and he goes um he's like their manager yeah, he was actually the producer, Ted yeah. Currier, who was a big DJ on WBLS. You know, he the the, the, the Quiet Storm, the, the R&B Black Station. He was yeah. like famous, and he became a producer. And so Ted turns to, to Tommy, and he was like, "I would, I can you prove that? I doubt it." And he said, "I got a cassette right here. This is like how fate works." So he takes Ted, and they're sitting in my friend Tommy, little piece of crap Toyota Corolla. The best thing he had in there was a stereo. He puts the tape in. And he's like, is this all programmed? He goes, the keyboards are programmed. Some of it's programmed, but that drummer's live. And all the perk is programmed. I'm playing guitar. You know, the bass is programmed. Because, but, and he goes, he said, you, could play, you do this live? And he's like, yeah, that's how we got the gig with Sweet Sensation. Oh, my God. Yeah. So just Your friend just going, oh, man, come on. We, I can we've, do got, we've got a better band than this. Yeah. And, and, and we, we, it turned out we wound up using some different musicians for the tour because the keyboard player who was in the wedding band, he didn't want to do it and for whatever reason, which I think is nuts. Hold on. My email just opened. What the heck is this? <laughs> messed up my screen. So, yeah. So, you so know. That, that's the first gig. And then so from kicking butt on that, it, that had to lead to another and another gig and another yes. gig. Yeah, actually, before that, I had played with the. Um, I was doing a lot of the fifties gigs, the Shirelles, the Marvelettes, the Platters, the yeah. Platters. I did that all that, and they would do. They Planners. would do like yeah. I was doing a lot of that stuff, some sixties artists and stuff, and I was playing with a lot of, a lot of, um, man, a lot of singer songwriter people. It was crazy it, in that time. I mean, um, oh gosh, what's her name? You know, you say what's her name? Oh my Alanis God, Alanis no. Anyway, it, just all these. You know, it, it oh was, no, Lisa Loeb. Lisa Loeb. Lisa Loeb. Yeah, we play, I used to play with hards, but did gigs with her and like bitter end and stuff like that. Bitter end. Bitter yeah, end. Yeah. CBGBs. I played with Dee Dee Ramone from the Ramones. That was a pretty great experience. That was uh, he did a pop band. Oh, check it out, man. That's awesome. Look at that. What are the chances, man? So what you got to play CBGBs before it became a John Varvato store. Yeah, I did. I played CBGBs a lot. They had the best sound system in town and that was a great club that how about that bathroom yeah the bathroom was, was <laughs> I gotta tell you that you, the, 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 the uh, dressing rooms were worse than the bathrooms ouch it was pretty it was a it was a funky place but you know what who, no matter who you were playing with or showcasing with record labels came to CBGB's yeah they did they came so you know so I played there a lot and playing there with Didi was great because it was Didi Ramon and his stuff was like it was sort of like imagine if Brian Adams at the time decided to kind of add a punk element to his music. That it was the greatest. It was it was like grunge before it was grunge. Yeah, we got to play with him, and then the drugs really just they spiraled real down after that. But that was yeah. Cool. You never got sidetracked with any of that stuff. You you, no. you you kept yourself nice and clean. I did. You know what? I where I grew up, there was a a, a very drug element in there. I mean, you know. Yeah. 
I've had to do- dodge the mob question, being an Italian in the, in the South. You know, it's like, I'm not Sicilian. That's a big deal. I did My family was Italian, but it's very uh, removed from that. But the neighborhood I grew up in was the neighborhood right next to where John Gotti lived, the Howard Beach. Wow. So there was a, lo- a big, and, and LaGuardia Airport, well, you know, I mean, let's put it this way. There were a lot of drugs in our neighborhood. It was peddled very heavily. And I have a lot of dead friends that died in high school, college age, from it. And, you know, I just, I was around it. I can't say I'm innocent of never trying it, but I got to tell you, I'm a little bit of a control freak. And I never liked playing out of control. Not not a chance. And I saw too many guys playing with it. You know, they were great. I knew they were great players, and they'd be up there playing, and they sounded like shit because they, they were out of their mind, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the odd thing with Didi was is when he was not high on heroin, we were a little afraid. He used to have a pocket knife. He'd pull it out. If he, you know, he was a strange cat. You know, <laughs> but when he was high, he was like you and me. He was normal. It was so weird. But I just saw too many guys go down with it. And you know, I had a very strict family. My dad was not into drugs. He didn't drink. Um, I wasn't around it. And it was sort of like, man, if you and I'm going to tell you this. There was a guy across the street who was an idol of mine, a Joey Pellegrino. And he was in the Navy. He was way older than me. And he was like, oh, Joey, you know, he was a, an idol. He came home and got told. And, and I remember one time he was walking down the street, all kind of freaked out, Crazy. falling into fences. And and he it was like so satanic. And I don't know, it was so just so scary to see him like that. And my mom said, he's, he's, that's what drugs, he's on drugs. And it scared the crap out of me. Well, maybe he, maybe he, he got some PTSD before he oh, even knew what it was. Yeah, from it, it, Yeah, because it's from Vietnam. He didn't, of course, I'm sure. Oh, my God, yeah. It's yeah. a shame. I yeah. mean, you know, he got himself together. I mean, he got himself together, which was great later in life. But I just remember that one moment. It scared the crap out of me. So I was just, I was very, um, I, you know, I, I just did, I just never found that to be, and, you know, I was in bands, and so many people in bands um, that ruined the band because they were high. Yeah, and they put drugs before it, and, I just, and then and then you ended up you went when you ended up coming to Nashville, which was over twenty five years ago. Yeah, ninety seven. We came the same time. Oh, the same year. Yeah, we came the same year, dude. I, if I remember, I got a great memory. Oh my I, God, we went, the first the, you know, the first time we met was we met at a Virgil Donati drum clinic. Oh my God! At, on Cannery Row. It was, and it was. I came with a couple guys from the Christian music industry because I was in that at that time. Yeah, because you, because I was saying we were talking about him. drugs, and then I was like, okay, and then you ended up coming and working with Kathy Tricoli and right. Susan Ashton, you know, and all that whole group. So, I can, those guys split, and it was you, it was me, you, Jim Riley, Lee Kelly, Pat McDonald, maybe. No, Pat wasn't with us. It was another drummer, but I can't remember who it was. I mean. And it was you were like, hey man, we're going to Barbers to sit in. A, there's a jam afterward, and those guys wouldn't go because it was a bar. And I'm like, hell yeah, man, I'm going. And that was it. We went, and then we. That's that's how we started. And if you remember, we went. We did 16th Avenue South. We used to have our little drummers group. Yes. We did it with that gang, and then it was you know Barbers and Broken. But we did we did all that crap we together. We did. We right? just we try to get get seen, get heard. And then when we were talking, I, that was my had been my second week here in Nashville, and you'd come like two weeks before that. Oh my God. Yeah. So that was like you know. That was that. That was the time. So yeah, I've been here since then. So that you're bringing time. all that New York experience, and and then there was something that I didn't know that you ever lived in Los Angeles. But there was a period where you were there, and then I'm Three reading years. I'm reading your bio because I know you as a human being. I didn't like I don't like bio. Oh my god, the first time I've ever read your bio, and there was something about um, John Robinson mentioning something to you, which was the catalyst for you creating the first home tracking facility in well, Nashville for well, drummers. It, the fir- it was the first one that got press. I, at the time, I believe Greg Morrow had a place and Steve Brewster was starting to do a room yep. when I did mine. There was a couple guys doing, kind of putting it together. Yeah. But I got, mine was in Mix Magazine. I got yeah. Kevin Becca. I got a lot of press from it. So that, that, that was, it was good and bad. But the John Robinson thing, all right, so California, what happened was I was with Sweet Sensation for like a year and a half. We toured relentlessly, world tour. We toured everywhere. Then they they finished touring, and we had toured. We'd opened up for a guy named Stevie B, um, who was, you know, in, it was like that Johnny Gill and, oh, man, I can't remember, all those 
black R&B dudes at the time, you know, uh, Boys to Men and Tony, Tony, Tone and all that uh, stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Stevie, he liked a very diverse band. So he had a lot of Filipino guys and some black dudes and all that stuff. And, and he was like... I, he loved that I had I had like the Bon Jovi look. I had the long hair and the leather jacket. You know? And he's like, because if you remember, Rick James had that white blonde haired guitar player in his band. If you look oh, at all, he goes, like, "You're gonna be my Rick James guitar player." And I was like, "All right, whatever, man." So I went. I I joined his band right after Sweet Sensation, and he lived in L.A. So I had a, we moved into a house. It was great. It was Red Fox's old estate. You know. Wow. From yeah, it was pretty awesome. So we did that, and then we toured for two years. And while I was out there, I met Diane Warren, and I actually lived in her house for a little bit when I had I needed a place to crash. We got very close, and because she wrote, wrote a song uh, Stevie sang on, and her manager at the time was from Queens, and we had a lot of the same friends. So it was a great, and I, I, you know, I totally made an ass out of myself. I'm sitting like, you know, we were at the studio, and they wrote this tune, and this guy Guy Roche was producing it, and it was Diane's there, and I. At that point in my career, I'm thinking music directors. I'm not thinking songwriters. I, yeah, I song if they were singing a song, but that you know that wasn't in my wheelhouse. You know, I I knew she wrote some stuff for Taylor Dane, was a Long Island chick, Sally Wonderman. I knew her when she was in Long Island. Wait and, a minute, uh, that's uh, Taylor's real name, Sally Wonderman. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, yeah. so so the, she had a cover band. So anyway, so there was I kind of knew who she was. So. Her, this, Stevie's manager says you got to go come to the studio. You, I want you to meet Diane. She wrote the song. Her manager's from Queens. Blah blah blah. So we go in there, and I'm sitting with Guy and myself and Diane, and we're they're putting this track together for Stevie. So he had some drums programmed, and I was like, eh. and they were asking me like, you know, what do you think? And I'm like, oh. I said, boy, it was a song called "Kiss the Tears Away," and they had a four rat, which was like the best sampled drum sounds ever. It was like underground; no one knew what a four rat was. So they were like, "Well, would you play the drums?" I'm like, "Yeah, I did." So I poked it out, and then uh, then I wanted to play drums on it. And our bass player, Stevie's bass player, came with me, and he came. He played bass, and then guys like, "I'm gonna leave. You guys got it. You finish it." So I'm sitting there with Diane, we're, we're, we're finishing this freaking song that you know he was producing i'm like how did i get in charge of doing this you know what i mean <laughs> so i'm just hanging in with diane and it was so it was good that i didn't know how famous she was because i would have ruined it so then we all go to dinner at her house and so we're sitting at you know we get to the house and it's a big beautiful house and my friend was cooking this um all this filipino food so there and there was a woman there from um um rca records um, and she's like, so what do you like? What do you really like to play? You don't look like an R&B drummer. I said, no, I said, you know, I'm into, Bad English was out at the time. I was, oh, yeah. I said, you know, when you when I see you smile, I said, you know, the, new, the Aerosmith stuff. I was naming all Diane's songs. I had no idea she wrote them. Oh, my God. And, and Diane goes, do you, do you like the songs or do you like the playing? I'm like, yeah, the songs are good. But, you know, yeah, I love that style. I said, the songs are great. She goes, do you know the lyrics? I said, well, I'm not much of a lyric guy. And then she goes, you know, she wrote these songs. And I'm like, yeah, oh, my God, I'm an ass, you know. But they thought I was cute. And, like, my ignorance was bliss for them. And it was refreshing. So I totally was blended into that's that incredible. thing and then afterward we went to the movies it was me diane and this woman from rca and we're walking into the theater and we went to see la story which was so funny in LA. oh my god yeah yeah and i bought the tickets and the the woman from the record label i wish i could remember her name it was connie and she was like don't you know who she is you have she, she you don't buy i said no i said i was born to be a gentleman i'm going to the movies with two ladies you buy them tickets and so that started my relationship with Diane and Doreen, her manager, and Charles. And so we got to be really good friends. So I was in California for two years, did some stuff with her, and we were really tight. But then I, went, then I moved back. Uh, stuff went really south with Stevie. I won't get into all that. But um, I wound up coming back to New York. And there's, there's a big, you know, you know, I'm pretty deep in my spiritual life. There's a, there was a big spiritual time when it was like, okay, you're here at this, you know, at this place. You know, there's a jacuzzi, it's 10 in the morning, there's a bowl of cocaine, there's two naked chicks, a naked guy, and, you know, it's like, you kind of, this is, it's this or that, what do you want to do? You oh, know? you mean, that was, that's what was happening in LA? Yeah, that was, I was hanging out with some people where it was, it was party time, man, it was, it was some, it was some crazy stuff, and I just, 
and it really was like and I like I said the drug thing wasn't my thing um, I had been through relationships and it was like you know and when you're on tour guys you know there's a lot at your disposal without even asking just there it's just there and sometimes it gets boring you know sometimes it's like ah. Oh. I don't want to see another naked chick. You know, what I mean? or it's like you know, it, I, I, I just want to go play video games. You know, it's like it gets to be too much. So there was a point where it was like I made a decision, and it was spiritually aided. I'll just say, yeah, and reluctantly because I loved California. But I came home, and I, it was a whole different. My dad was so happy I was home, and my grandmother wound up getting sick, passing away right after that. I met my wife, remet my wife, and so that's. So that, so I went back to New York. I was there for a couple of years, got married. Then my father passed away. Um, and I was, I was doing a lot of work in New York. I was doing the wedding thing. I was doing very heavily into the jingle cycle of uh, tracking, doing a lot of drum programming um, and a lot of jingle producing, producing jingles. And um, so then I met Kathy Tricoli. And Kathy was, she was on the wave of Amy Grant, Got, did that big tune with Pizza Tira, so the Christian artists were crossing over. Yeah. Kathy had a big hit with a song that Diane Warren wrote, which was cr- kind of crazy. Wow. So I wound up playing with Kathy because the drummer in her band couldn't really hang with the click, and they were doing stuff with tracks. And, I, and yeah. at that point, the music was no longer on sequences. It was all on D88s or ADATs. And you, that was mini that, discs. Mini discs, yeah, the whole bit. And you I was, survived all the technology. survived all the technology. That's right, my brother. So because I was good at that, I, I did this one show with her, and that was it. Then I was her drummer for three years. And we did a lot of pop gigs, opened up for Brian Adams. We opened up for Michael Bolton, um, did a lot of cool gigs. And then it was like, how come we never do your Christian gigs. We were all Christian guys in her band. The band was from Pittsburgh. It's like, how come? And then she's like, well, when the, the, the way it works in Nashville is they have one band and they play for all the artists and I'm not a headliner, blah, blah, blah. So I, but I was getting real kind of tired of New York. The scene was becoming very um, R&B loop heavy. It was, there was less live drumming going on in the studios as, as it were and you know it just I did and I just it, things were changing so I wound up coming to visit during GMA which was a big gospel music association week when they That's had right. the awards so I came to Nashville with her a couple times just to play Jim Bay behind her at some little shows and stuff and I just started meeting people and they were intrigued by the fact that I was a New Yorker and they used to say can you play like uh, on the, the way the Sting records are. Can you play like the New York guys? I'm like, well, I am a New York guy. You know, and, he, and, they, and they would be like, well, can you play like, you know, Sean Pelton? It's like, yeah, Sean's one of my best buds. He subs on my wedding gig for me. It was great because people, <laughs> they never wanted you to sub on, on a wedding gig. And I'm like, but I got the guy from Saturday Night Live. He's going to wear the big tie. And the hat. So I was like, yeah, that's kind of the circle. Near Z was in that whole yeah, near, group, yeah. you know? So. He was a lot more famous than I ever was in that scene. I mean, he was he was great, and so and a great guy, great guy, great drummer. Loved watching him play. He was so f- such finesse with such power. He's married. Finesse and power. Me. He does. Yeah. He's the guy, and um, so yeah. So they, I started getting calls to do records, Christian records, here while I was living in New York because they wanted something different. And so after enough of that, and through the connections with Kathy, and then she did. Her record, perfect ser- segue. She was doing her new record, where she was going to be the headlining artist for the tour. She goes to California. Her producers were Peter Bonetta and Pete. Uh, Peter Bonetta and Cheese. I can't remember the other guy's name. Oh, forgive me. Anyway, so Kathy's like, "Hey, do you want to come out to California with me while I do my record?" And she goes, "The band is Robbie Buchanan." John Robinson, Vale Johnson was playing bass with Lucy. Nice. Him. And um, uh, the guitar player. Um, oh my gosh. Um, Dean Parks. No. Um, uh, he, uh, the younger guy, Michael Thompson. Gotcha. Michael Thompson. So the band was insane. And we're at this Castle Oaks studio, and it was just a beautiful thing. And I'm going to hang out with John Robinson for two weeks, you know? Yeah. 
So I was real nervous the first day going in. Like, you know, is he going to want the drummer from the band hanging around? I mean, oh my gosh, it's got to be, you know. And so I meet everybody. Everybody is wonderful. And uh, Kathy introduces me, and he's like, hey, John Robinson, nice to meet you, man. Real great, you know. And he says, hey, listen. And he pulls me into the room immediately. Listen, you, if, if you know, you play with her. So if the other things you think that I should bring to this, that well, just let me know. I almost shit my pants. I'm like, John, I, 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 yeah, I'm a big professional, you know. He was awesome. He was the best. And I was blown away because he had a 9x13, 10x14, 16x16, and 16x18. Huge cymbals, little piccolo snare, yep. big hi-hats, big bass drum. And in New York at the time, we were like, I was, was I still living in New York? No, I was living, was I living here at that time? Yeah, that was the time of the piccolo. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, actually, I was still living in New York at that time. Yeah. And um, it was right before I moved here. And um, I'm like, dude, we're playing on 10 by 10, 8 by 12, 14 by 14s in New York. Well, yeah. And he goes, no, oh, big drums, big sound. You know, it was great. So, and it was so funny to watch him because, you know, he's if not the most recorded drummer ever, if you might have surpassed Hal Blaine, you know, Kenny Aronoff's probably the second guy who's living. But, man, it was so wild to watch him play. You know, you're thinking of rock with you, you know, so funky and slinky, you know. But when you watch him, it's like he looks, like, so tense and so, like, f not frantic, but it looks doesn't look as smooth as, as it, it sounds. sounds. It's just because he's just so intense and it's his whole body's into it. And man, I learned a ton in that watching him. So we started talking just every day. And at one point I was like, so, you know, are you, how, he was asking me about, I was telling him I'm going to be moving to Nashville, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. And I said, you know, I would love to move to California. He goes, oh, it's changing in California. He goes, you know, I do about 35% of my work in my house now. And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, now computers, Pro Tools wasn't out yet. But he was like, oh, yeah, I have a whole ADAT system. And I Digital Performer. And yeah, that wasn't out yet. That stuff was... Oh, it was, wow. It was... It, Pro Tools was, was sound tools, and it was becoming Pro Tools. Yeah, right. but it was only like... wasn't quite it. Like the radar system, that digital system was starting to come out. Yeah. Um, so it was in the very beginning stages when all that stuff was going to hit. So, But he said to me, yeah, it's doable, man. He says, I do 35% of my work. And he said... Trust me, the next 10 years, you, you got to be doing drums in your own room. Got to have a room. You got to have a room. And I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to do that? I can't afford that. I can never afford that. And the other thing was, at these studios I worked at, I always wound up becoming the guy that would do the books for the studio. You know, I, I would run the studio part. Uh, and it was like a big minus every month because four things of the console went down. You got to call Eddie Soletti, who was like $100 an hour back in 1988. You know what I mean? It was like, it was always a negative. It, it never made money in the studio. So I was like, I never go, oh my, what, what are you talking about? So I kind of freaked out a little bit. But it was in the back of my head. You know, and then that that kind of, when it when the idea of it came up here, that sort of, made me go yeah i think i gotta do this you know john robinson and, if john robinson said so what what year was that pal we moved into this house in the year 2000 moved here in 97 we gave it a th we gave it three years everyone said it's a seven-year town but what worked out for me is that when i moved here that spring of 97 that fall of 97 and that's when i kind of went or different ways with you guys because I went on tour with Kathy and right. got into that whole CCM world of, uh, of touring and Point stuff. Point of Grace and all Point that Point of stuff. Grace and all those did, guys. Did yeah. you ever work with um, Paul Chapman on bass? Oh, Wasn't God, it? yeah, a lot. Yeah, he, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a ton. Oh and um, so things kind of happened for me quickly because I was Kathy's music director and I actually wound up having to hire musicians. So being a new guy in town hiring guys kind of got me into that whole world. So that that's... so. I started work, so we were like, okay, it's three years. Our lease is up at our home. We still had our home in New York. We were renting out to somebody. Nice. And we said, we're staying here. This is it. Nashville, you know, Nashville's the place. So we got this the house in Franklin. And what's my control room was a utility room, and the garage was the garage. And this was just the room where my drums were to practice. I had a crappy little Slingerland set that I had, and I had my rack that I toured with with the two D88s in it. 
And at that time, I was touring with a group, Avalon, and they were really popular. Very popular. Christian group. They were huge. And they had hit every week. So I, they would want to add the songs to the set. And I'm like, oh, my God, I only have an hour. You know, I got it. So I would have to edit the songs. So I would do it with two D88s. I would edit the songs, like, in real time. Don't ask me how I did. I don't know how I did oh it. Oh my god! So I did. I mean, I'm used was used to editing tapes and rolling back video to tape from my days previous. And then what I would do, I had a Roland mixer, couple little compressors, and I would play the tapes through my Roland mixer and mic to my drums because the room here was wasn't treated. It was just a loud, crap sounding room. I don't want to go deaf, so I put headphones on, put a few mics on the kit, maybe four. And just would practice to it and go, okay, it feel it. now I gotta nudge it, I gotta nudge it. So at the time, my friends would come over who were keyboard players and whatnot, just my buddies, and they would be like, Oh, let me hear your drums. Let me hear what it sounds like. I'm like, no, it sounds like crap, you know? And they put the headphones on and they'd be like, Oh my gosh, I would pay you to have this sound on the demos I'm doing. Because at that time Hillary Hillary Duff hit. Um and country was starting to go thanks to you a little more rock <laughs> you really brought that element you really did you guys changed you you're you and the band you your little what do you call it little, we, yeah we were the three kings yeah you guys they did and guys listening he did he you know he, he, richie changed those guys changed country music for the better i thought wow, thanks. and so what started happening is his country demos weren't mm, on your heart. they were more they wanted stuff yeah and so what happened and this is not a slam on the country guys doing demos but they started going into the christian market to get those guys to program keyboards and do pop stuff and so, but they wanted live drums so those guys would use the loops off of cds and or program drums for four hours to make it sound live so yeah. these guys and basically their wives convinced my wife because the wives would get together when we would all be on tour, and the wives would say, "We heard Tony's doing a studio," and Lori's like, "No, he's not going to do it. He says it's too expensive." And they're like, "No, he's got to do the studio because every time Steve is home, every time Sal is home, every time Bernie's home, every time, the, every time I need them to do, watch the kids, he's too, he's he's always working on drums for four hours, you know, programming drums. So I'll, Tony's going. So that literally was how I got into it. So brought a pro, brought a. Uh, so the room just person. sounded good. Well, what happened at that? It just well, it was really because I dialed in the stuff, and this little control room did sound good. It actually did sound good. Yeah, and you so, and now you do full tracking sessions well, now, with now, bands and yeah, because now well, it, it then escalated into the 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 garage. You know, I I recorded my drums and a, a guy and I was producing this band to see if I, how, how if I could do that. How many tracks could I record? You know, I still a digital performer at the time, and I got this little worship band in here. And I said, let me see if I could do a band. And I put them in my den, sounded like crap. Put the drums in the garage, and I was like, holy crap! <laughs> drum set. And so then that's when I moved the drums into there, and slowly by slowly it became that. So in two two thousand, I started the room, the small room, and then in two thousand two. I converted into the garage and then in 2003 I think that's when I did a record Steve Ferroni did one half of it and I did the other half of it nice and Kevin Becker mixed it he you, you know Kevin right sounds you know like Kevin? yeah but yeah, Kevin yeah. he lived in town he moved, he was at Blackbird he just recently passed away but he was the editor wow. for Mix magazine so he called me up from he lived in Phoenix at the time he calls me up and I'm thinking he's gonna tell me everything that sucks with my room you know so I call him back and he's like, you know, I recorded Ferroni, who I knew from back in New York, and he's like, I recorded Ferroni in this beautiful studio, multi-million dollar studio, did the mixes, put your drums in, and I had to keep taking stuff off. He says, all I did is I, comp I compressed your kick and snare and put a two bus over the drum mix, and that's, that's, that's the mix. What are you doing there? So that's how, and it wound, and I didn't realize he was the editor for Mix Magazine. I could, didn't put two and two together. Yeah. So after we had our conversation, I sent the pictures of my room. He put some pictures in Mix Magazine, did a little blurb on me there. Yeah. And so that's when it really... So that's when the, the Downtown Battery was born. And if you guys want to check out the website, and Battery is spelled B-A-T-T-E-R-I-E, downtownbattery.com. Batteria, like downtown. Uh, yeah, I mean, like a batterista. Um, so like you're... Um, 
uh, you know, the website is great because you got your, you know, your. You're smart enough and brave enough to list all your gear because you have an amazing gear. All the compressors, <laughs> all the too. mics, all, stuff. all the stuff, all the gears, all completely listed. You know, the price per track. You're not hiding anything. You got great testimonials on there, photos, all the producers you've worked with, all the musicians you've worked with over the years. And it's incredible. And and you're always like, we have a great workflow. Like, I'll come over there and do a lot of things. You're nice enough to open up the, the room to me. And it's so cool. cool when two drummers work together because you can be like, hey, man, try the uh, try the uh, upbeat accents on the maracas or you know pick up that you know pick up the brass jingle tambourine and oh man use that drum right there and then i end up hitting the head and you're like it's all right i got more i got more of them you know steve love myers my best friend i love it so tomorrow tomorrow we're doing a five track rock five together, yeah so, yeah yeah you know because because the, cause the uh, my buddy you know who's worked in tv and film and all these you know great outlets writing jingles um you know he's no stranger to wanting a huge modern rock drum sound so i was like we got to go to tony's yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's just it, the room has just got that thing i mean we, i could have probably moved you know what i mean to, into a better bigger house when we had the kids but, but we didn't because it just it's got a kind it's got its own thing Oh, it's you just know? charming. Well, you're like you're like wedged in right there. You're not too close to your neighbors, and you don't really need the garage because your you know your driveway is great, yeah, and it's yeah. just a great it's great it's spread, like, man. Yeah, it's just cool, man. It's just it's worked, you know. It's just worked, and it's uh, you know, it's it was so foreign that it, it but it's so crazy. Like at the time, there's a, I love the movie Moneyball, the sports movie, and you know, at the end, the guy talks about the the Billy Bean is talking with the uh, owner of the Boston Red Sox because the first guy through the wall is always gets bludgeoned because I would show up then I would show up at Omni or not Omni but they were always cool but like any studio I would show up at Ocean Way and the guy there the manager heard I was in a room and he came and lambasted me saying you, you know who do you think you are you're going to put us out of business you can't do drums in a small room I'm like look man I made records in New York and it, where the drums were in a vocal booth yeah. and you know so I was never I was never trying to compete with big rooms ever. I just figured I'm always, I'm going to make it possible cuz it would kill me when I was you know get hired to play someone's gig and they'd send me their CD and it would be like badly programmed drums on these awesome songs and i'm like why did not you just cut real drums it's, well we can't afford it and i'm like yeah no man yeah, but it just but ruined your music man those those days gotta go you know there's got to be a way to, to get great drums so that that's sort of what i and it was always that kind of thing it was never to put studios out of business but it just you know it's yeah uh, you're, you're taking the, you're taking the music business by the horns yeah. and 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 controlling what you can control because you know you work on music row you work in berry hill you yeah, know you yeah. you do you know you you do the stuff but it's like you could walk down in your pajamas with your coffee That's and right. crank out movie soundtracks video games right. uh station ids custom records you can have a full tracking band tomorrow i'm coming over with my composer buddy with a bunch of snacks and hummus and almonds and yeah. a <laughs> gallon of water and we're gonna i'm gonna yeah, bring man. about six shirts and we're gonna sweat oh, which and, by the way make from music Rich's, from rich's last session is gonna be a prize <laughs> you're gonna raffle off the rich a redmond towel the sweaty towel uh, the sweaty towel i'm gonna put it on ebay i bet i might get some money some some someone will buy it <laughs> jason aldean's drum rich redmond's sweaty towel oh my god that's so I'll funny get a nickel for it anyway oh my god hey man um hey so you know usually i have a it's so funny i have a i have a co-host um jim mccarthy jim mccarthy voiceovers.com he's a killer friend he's a drummer you know he's like a hobbyist you know i'm like yeah. jim that great decision you know make your money from voiceover and producing podcasts and then go down to your basement and just play the drums for fun you don't have to yeah, worry about slapping them you don't have to worry about you right. know um but anyways we he usually has this part of the show called the uh the fast five or the favorite five i'm gonna ask you the fast five questions and you just try not to think and you just tell us what you think favorite color purple all right purple drums um favorite food indian yeah like i so know tiki I masala yeah, any, yeah, any, any Indian food. Ooh, and the sog, I love that. Yeah. Um, favorite drink? Bourbon. Oh man, we got to do that. Uh, yeah. This is now. This is a hard one to do. Um, favorite song or one that just haunts you every day of your life? It's just always when you when it's on, you're going to listen to the whole thing. Oh man, there's so many. I know, right? Oh my, it is. It's it's hard to just. Or it could be a favorite artist. Man, it's 
it's crazy. It's this there's so many so many. Um let's put it this way. It, okay. I'm going to tell you Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. Wow. Yeah. For the guitar solo alone. Yeah, see Dave Gilmore is like one of my favorite guitar players of all time. Nick Mason's one of my favorite drum. I'm a Huge Rush fan. I was a big prog rock guy. I love Al Demiola, Return to Forever, all the prog music, all the jazz fusion stuff I went through. Yeah. Love pop, right? Brian Adams, all that stuff from that era. I love all that stuff. That's what we grew up on. Journey, Steve Smith. Oh, my God, yeah. But, man, you know, that that song just has a, you know, the whole, if you watch the making of it, it talks about absence. The, the song's about absence, you know? And maybe, maybe it has something to do with my parents getting divorced or being on tour for so long, being, you know, by yourself. Because you can be on tour and be by, you know, lonely at the, at the same time, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I there's just something about that song. When it comes on, it's like, do 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 Stop. Yeah. You know, it's just, just it. it's just, it's just, so I wish yeah. you were here. I mean, for for me, for me, uh, like that that version of that is is the movie Alien, you know, because I could see it like right when the credits are starting to come on in the beginning, uh -huh. or it could be the last five minutes, or it could be somewhere in the middle. I'm gonna see it through. I'll be like, you yeah. know, cancel right. my appointment. I'm um, I'm watching, uh, you know, I'm watching it. Yeah. What's your favorite movie? That's the last question. The Natural. Oh yeah. The okay. Movie. Yeah, man. I'm a big sports guy. You know. My son's yeah, so an athlete and all yeah, that, your son's but, an athlete. Yeah. but uh, yeah, there's there's a lot about that movie that I love. You know, there's a lot I wish I was a sports guy, man. I don't know. Like I was saying to you the other day, man. That, that, man, I did my son's recruiting, and yeah. even with that, he wound up transferring schools. It's the sports business is worse than the music business. I mean, that's you know, a bold because, statement. I'll tell you why. Like what you just said about your buddy. If all else fails. We could come down in our drum rooms, put on our headphones, put on Wish You Were Here, put on a Jason Aldean song, put on a, a Rush song, put on a Frankie Valli song with Hal yeah. Blaine playing on it, and play along and play and do our thing. You can't catch a football by yourself. Do you know what I'm saying? Someone's so got to throw it. Son's a wide receiver. That's why I say catch a yeah, football. Yeah. So you got you, and you know you have to be in, on a team you have to be and there's so many parameters so many things that so it's really a very and it is the entertainment industry you know but it's really it that it's a tough business it's a tough business and, and and going through that was tough but i do love the sports analogies and the you know the um teamwork the teamwork because that's what a band or a session is about man it's gotta sound like you know when you eat a sauce, you don't want you don't think just about to me. It's 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 everything or a soup. Everything's got to blend, and f for the out for the for the best outcome. You know what I mean? So that's and the macaroni being the singer and the sauce being the band because it's all yeah, about yeah. the macaroni and the sauce. Being, so it's 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 food and, and and sports analogies for me. You know yeah. what I mean? And and, and uh, you know so that movie's got a lot of it's got a lot of stuff that through my life has I could point to a lot of things in the music I'll have to, re I'll have to revisit that and so yeah. and then you say you're a good cook I mean oh yeah how often are you uh doing that or do you pass it off to your bride sometimes you're like hey you, you uh, handle it she, tonight I, she unfortunately cooks probably more than I do but it, it it really should change I mean you know when it, we both worked it was like whoever got home first cooked and it was always her because you know two and a six she's she's um, you know corporate America so she was always home early we're finishing, you know, at five or whatever, whatever, whatever our, our scene is, or you know, so or we're working at six. So yeah, but I do love to cook, and I'm I'm more of like I could come home and we have nothing and make something and go, holy crap, man, this is pretty good. You know, I mean, <laughs> my grandma like, like some old bread and some cheese. You got some grilled cheese. You got to like you yeah. know. Got yeah. something, got some peppers. You got, oh, we got this. We, oh, we got cucumbers. I'll fry them up. I'll put them breadcrumb, the eggs. We'll fry the cucumbers. And we, yeah, I do all that stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So that's cool. nice, buddy. Yeah, that'll be nice. Really, really good. I, I, I love this reminiscing, man. And I, I, thanks for rattling my cage. I guess we did move here 
the same exact time, and then we did get pulled. Into, I went the country route. You went the CCM route. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And which then at just, the time, none of you know, the two didn't meet. You know what I mean? Which is kind of a drag. You know, I know. what I mean? Now everything but, just kind of cross pollinates. Yeah, everything's cross pollinated, and I really I'm not part of that. I've aged out. You know, and I maybe I don't go to the right church. I don't know. It's, it's the CCM. I mean, I still play worship, and I love it. I, and I love to me. That's really why I have my gift. I love playing in church. I love worshiping with it, and doing that whole thing and I think you know I think the you know there's there's a part it's, I'm not going to get overly I'm not going to you know pros, I'm not going to proselytize a lot but there are parts in the scripture where it says that they sent the drummers first before the battle you know to clear out demons and to clear, you know so there's something about what we do oh, yeah. that has power in, in oh. other realms that we don't know. I mean, Uns- you know, unspoken power, and unspoken it's power, it's man's yeah. per, it's man's first instrument before we even did, knew that we could do something besides grunt. We were taking with the drums, drums. Yeah, yeah, it was the drums, man. And you know, on the producer side of me is like, you know, you you could fix drums and stuff like that. Now, yeah, oh, sure. But if the you know this, if the drum track of a song is not right. It's like building a house on sand. The drums, it's not because I'm a drummer. It's so important, especially in a live, a live band, too. If the drums are the you can have the greatest players, but if you have the weakest, if the band, if the drums are not solid, you got nothing. Yeah, and a good drummer can elevate an average band. Average band. How right? many, yes, how many bands have you seen where you go, well, how many jump, jump gigs have you done where it's like, okay, yeah, this, this is a little better. Not because I'm doing because we're professional musicians, and sometimes you get booked to do something where there's not all professional guys, but it elevates the band. You, you know, know we, got, we got to lock this down, man. We, we got to like down. play these it's phrases, something. play this time, you know, do yep. the colors, shape right. the, you know. Yeah, it, it's absolutely. major. Man. Yeah. Well, dude, I can't, wait, I can't wait to see you tomorrow. Oh, see you tomorrow? You'll yes, like- see you tomorrow. I'm going to pick up a couple of uh, Black Beauties and things and some extra nice. heads because I don't want to pit every one of your heads. You know. Are you bringing cymbals? I'm going to bring some uh, some of my Sabians, and then Sabians. we're both DW guys. You know. Yeah. Um, I've been with DW, um, I think, like like 10 or 11 years. How long for you? I have been, So I'm here what? So I came here in 97, so I'm here 26 years. I have 25 years. 20, Four years. Incredible. DW. Yeah. Yeah, man. I just took I took that side, you know, turn with Sonar for a while, and then mm-hmm. you know, I mean, what a just an amazing company. G- DW drums. I mean, I yeah. I'm staring right at my little performance series kit. You know, the shells are two thousand dollars. They wow. are so snappy they're and so drums, man. I yeah. love those drums. I actually, I I opt. I was going to get a set just to have them, and that yeah. would be like my around town kit. Yeah. And record because it does have a snappy thing to it. But I bought a bass drum that I saw on on Music Go Round. It was a, the the Red Ludwig bass drum I have. It's intact, red sparkle, the way it was made in the factory. They sold it cheap, man, and it sounded great. And I said, oh, this could be good. I'll build around it. You know, like I said, I could do all, and I'll sell a kit, make some extra money, get it. I, mean, I put the kit together. It sounded amazing. So I wound up keeping the damn kit. So I wound up spending what I would have spent on the performance kit on the Don Ludwig. Right. <laughs> I didn't get it, but that, I'm gonna I'm gonna get me one. I love that kit. I yeah, man. Oh no, they're 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 so snappy. You just throw the mics on there, and it's yeah. oh my god, it just works. Yeah. Well, man, this was just so such a pleasure to to go down memory lane. And then next for us is to well, yeah, we'll do a little bourbon and a fire pit or whatever, Absolutely, man. Absolutely, man. We'll, we'll get the thing happening, man. But I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And f- to all the listeners, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. And yeah, you know, give us a five star rating. You know, if if you can't yeah. give me a five star rating, tell me why not, and I'll do it. I'll come. I'll do your laundry. I'll cut the lawn. I'll do your. <laughs> he t- will. We Don't want do anything to, for you. Come on, give us a five star rating. You know, leave us Rich a nice wants review. Wants to make you happy. He wants to make all of you happy. He wants all of you to learn. He wants all of you to grow and be and be better and the best. That's the one thing I've always appreciated about you, man. Is that your heart is always in the right place. About you always want to share your gift and bring bring people to the to be the best. The version of themselves playing their instrument, their drums. Oh man, it's true. It's well, thanks, but like I just I'm lucky. I have a te- I have a teacher's heart. I think we have our specialties. Like you know, you have this uh, incredible ability with the wires and the cables and the mics and the <laughs> interface and how it all works together and producing and engineering. And it's like I would have to be like, Duh! you know what I mean? But it's like I I I can take any person at any level of their relationship with the instrument, and we could teach them something new. Oh, to yeah. 
taken and put in their back pocket. Yeah, you, you know? are the king of that. You are the king. You are great at that. You really oh, man. are. I appreciate it, man. And it, it, just the spirit in your, your playing is so great. So oh, I love too, watching man. you play, man. It's so good. Likewise, I, I, I do, uh, guys. I do love it, but every time a symbol gets hit, I'm like, oh man. Ouch! Oh, oh, but, oh. you know, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it just about broke my heart earlier this year because because I was recovering from like a minor surgery, and you asked me to do this double drummer yes, thing. double drummer thing. Ocean Fuck Way me. Studios with the thirty foot ceilings, and and we were going to be playing some like heavy, heavy stuff for like a video game. It just about broke my heart. Oh yeah, my God. It, it was it, it was sad, but it was good. I mean, Larry, it all worked out great. It oh. worked out great, but it, that would have been you know, hey, they loved what happened so who knows maybe you never know time. yeah maybe there's a lot of video games out there maybe we'll a do it again video games man yeah doing one before our session tomorrow is tomorrow the session what's tomorrow wednesday tomorrow's wednesday oh yeah you're doing a video yeah, game I, session I tomorrow right video game session in the morning before but it, it, yeah so i got that and that that's at blackbird actually see Sorry. so that's a, that's a pro that's what a pro does guys everybody tony's going to be up at 9 a.m getting drum sounds he's going to be doing the thing he'll be in and out by 12 he'll shine the union card he'll make his money he'll yeah. fight his way down to franklin to his own studio i'll be yeah. setting up and the next thing you know we're going to be recording rock, rock records into the night that's it man yeah, sounds man. good that sounds that's like good. a good day to me yeah 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 doesn't get better than that we might have to have you know a little a little bourbon break. Yeah, we might have to do that thing, man. You know, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Tony, I love you, man. I love you, man, too. I can't wait to see you, man. You're I, one of the best. I see you. Uh, I'll see you really soon. And hey, guys, to all the listeners out there, guys, thank you so much. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the podcast. Once again, thanks to Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. And we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Rich. I love you, bro. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe. Rate and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.